This is Classics of Liberty from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute, narrated by Caleb Brown. Today's classic is The Great Nation of Futurity by John L. O'Sullivan. In 1837, John Lewis O'Sullivan and his brother established the United States Magazine and Democratic Review in Washington, D.C., and it soon became one of the most important periodicals in American history. By late 1840, the brothers moved the magazine to New York City. The move marked a significant shift in American life. Throughout the 1830s and 1840s, New Yorkers gradually wrested cultural preeminence from puritanical and relatively stagnant Boston, enshrining New York City as the de facto capital of American life. In politics, economics, and now the arts, New York City and its radical cutting edge of loco foco Democrats and visionary artists led their fellow Americans into the brave new world of the mid-19th century, a period in which railroads connected continents and telegraphs converted ideas into electric signals allowing for instantaneous communication. John L. O'Sullivan and his Democratic Review gained fame, notoriety, and influence by spearheading the movement to produce an authentically American national culture distinct from European antecedents. Publishing now canonical authors like Whitman and Hawthorne as well as editorials written by O'Sullivan himself, the Democratic Review trumpeted the concept of manifest destiny, cast in a decidedly radical, liberal direction. The wider New York cultural movement identified itself with the phrase Young America, sharply contrasting the United States, which O'Sullivan called the great nation of futurity, with the monarchies, aristocracies, and corporate plutocracies proliferating throughout the old world. O'Sullivan and his fellow young Americans were far from perfect, and by no means were they equivalent to modern libertarians, but their vision and concepts of republicanism, democracy, and the United States constituted one of the most virulent and influential strains of liberal thinking in the entirety of 19th century America. The American people, having derived their origin from many other nations, and the Declaration of National Independence being entirely based on the great principle of human equality, these facts demonstrate our disconnected position as regards any other nation, that we have, in reality, but little connection with the past history of any of them, and still less with all antiquity, its glories or its crimes. On the contrary, our national birth was the beginning of a new history, the formation and progress of an untried political system, which separates us from the past and connects us with the future only. And so far as regards the entire development of the natural rights of man in moral, political, and national life, we may confidently assume that our country is destined to be the great nation of futurity. It is so destined because the principle upon which a nation is organized fixes its destiny, and that of equality, is perfect, is universal. It presides in all the operations of the physical world, and it is also the conscious law of the soul, the self-evident dictate of morality, which accurately defines the duty of man to man, and consequently man's rights as man. Besides, the truthful annals of any nation furnish abundant evidence that its happiness, its greatness, its duration were always proportionate to the democratic equality in its system of government. How many nations have had their decline and fall because the equal rights of the minority were trampled on by the despotism of the majority, or the interests of the many sacrificed to the aristocracy of the few, or the rights and interests of all given up to the monarchy of one. These three kinds of government have figured so frequently and so largely in the ages that have passed away that their history, through all time to come, can only furnish a resemblance. Like causes produce like effects, and the true philosopher of history will easily discern the principle of equality or of privilege working out its inevitable result. The first is regenerative, because it is natural and right. The latter is destructive to society, because it is unnatural and wrong. 
What friend of human liberty, civilization, and refinement can cast his view over the past history of the monarchies and aristocracies of antiquity and not deplore that they ever existed? What philanthropist can contemplate the oppressions, the cruelties, and injustice inflicted by them on the masses of mankind and not turn with moral horror from the retrospect? America is destined for better deeds. It is our unparalleled glory that we have no reminiscences of battlefields but in defense of humanity, of the oppressed of all nations, of the rights of conscience, the rights of personal enfranchisement. Our annals describe no scene of horrid carnage, where men were led on by hundreds of thousands to slay one another, dupes and victims to emperors, kings, nobles, demons in the human form called heroes. We have had patriots to defend our homes, our liberties, but no aspirants to crowns or thrones. Nor have the American people ever suffered themselves to be led on by wicked ambition to depopulate the land, to spread desolation far and wide, that a human being might be placed on a seat of supremacy. We have no interest in the scenes of antiquity, only as lessons of avoidance of nearly all their examples. The expansive future is our arena, and for our history. We are entering on its untrodden space with the truths of God in our minds, beneficent objects in our hearts, and with a clear conscience unsullied by the past. We are the nation of human progress, and who will, what can, set limits to our onward march? Providence is with us, and no earthly power can. We point to the everlasting truth on the first page of our National Declaration, and we proclaim to the millions of other lands that the gates of hell, the powers of aristocracy and monarchy, shall not prevail against it. The far-reaching, the boundless future will be the era of American greatness. In its magnificent domain of space and time, the nation of many nations is destined to manifest to mankind the excellence of divine principles, to establish on earth the noblest temple ever dedicated to the worship of the Most High, the sacred and the true. Its floor shall be a hemisphere, its roof the firmament of the star-studded heavens, and its congregation a union of many republics, comprising hundreds of happy millions, calling, owning no man, master, but governed by God's natural and moral law of equality, the law of brotherhood, of peace and goodwill amongst men. But although the mighty constituent truth upon which our social and political system is founded will assuredly work out the glorious destiny herein shadowed forth, yet there are many untoward circumstances to retard our progress, to procrastinate the entire fruition of the greatest good to the human race. There is a tendency to imitativeness, prevailing amongst our professional and literary men, subversive of originality of thought, and wholly unfavorable to progress. This propensity to imitate foreign nations is absurd and injurious. It is absurd, for we have never yet drawn on our mental resources that we have not found them ample and of unsurpassed excellence. Witness our constitutions of government, where we had no foreign ones to imitate. It is injurious, for never have we followed foreign examples in legislation. Witness our laws, our charters of monopoly, that we did not inflict evil on ourselves, subverting common right in violation of common sense and common justice. Taught to look abroad for the highest standards of law, judicial wisdom, and literary excellence, the native sense is subjugated to a most obsequious idolatry of the tastes, sentiments, and prejudices of Europe. Hence, our legislation, jurisprudence, literature, are more reflective of foreign aristocracy than of American democracy. European governments have plunged themselves in debt, designating burdens on the people, national blessings. Our state legislatures, humbly imitating their pernicious example, have pawned, bonded the property, labor, and credit of their constituents to the subjects of monarchy. It is by our own labor and with our own materials that our internal improvements are constructed, but our British law-trained legislators have enacted that we shall be in debt for them, paying interest, but never to become owners. But our British law-trained legislators have enacted that we shall be in debt for them, paying interest, but never to become owners. 
with various climates, soils, natural resources, and products beyond any other country, and producing more real capital annually than any other 16 million of people on Earth, we are nevertheless borrowers paying tribute to the money powers of Europe. Our businessmen have also conned the lesson of example and devoted themselves body and mind to the promotion of foreign interests. If states can steep themselves in debt with any propriety in times of peace, why may not merchants import merchandise on credit? If the one can bond the labor and property of generations yet unborn, why may not the other contract debts against the yearly crops and daily labor of their contemporary fellow citizens? And our literature, oh, when will it breathe the spirit of our republican institutions? When will it be imbued with the godlike aspiration of intellectual freedom, the elevating principle of equality? And our literature, oh, when will it breathe the spirit of our republican institutions? When will it be imbued with the godlike aspiration of intellectual freedom, the elevating principle of equality? When will it assert its national independence? and speak the soul, the heart of the American people? Why cannot our literati comprehend the matchless sublimity of our position amongst the nations of the world, our high destiny, and cease bending the knee to foreign idolatry, false tastes, false doctrines, false principles? When will they be inspired by the magnificent scenery of our own world, imbibe the fresh enthusiasm of a new heaven and a new earth, and soar upon the expanded wings of truth and liberty? Is not nature as original, her truths as captivating, her aspects as various, as lovely, as grand, her Promethean fire as glowing in this, our western hemisphere, as in that of the east? And above all, is not our private life as morally beautiful and good? Is not our public life as politically right, as indicative of the brightest prospects of humanity, and therefore is inspiring of the highest conceptions? Why then do our authors aim at no higher degree of merit than a successful imitation of English writers of celebrity? But with all the retrograde tendencies of our institutions, still they are compelled to follow the mighty impulse of the age. They are carried onward by the increasing tide of progress, and though they cast many a longing look behind, they cannot stay the glorious movement of the masses, nor induce them to venerate the rubbish, the prejudices, the superstitions of other times and other lands, the theocracy of priests, the divine right of kings, the aristocracy of blood, the metaphysics of colleges, the irrational stuff of law libraries. Already the brightest hopes of philanthropy, the most enlarged speculations of true philosophy, are inspired by the indications perceptible amongst the mechanical and agricultural population. There, with predominating influence, beats the vigorous national heart of America, propelling the onward march of the multitude, propagating and extending through the present and the future the powerful purpose of the soul which, in the 17th century, sought a refuge among savages and reared in the wilderness the sacred altars of intellectual freedom. This was the seed that produced individual equality and political liberty as its natural fruit. And this is our true nationality. American patriotism is not of soil. We are not aborigines, nor of ancestry, for we are of all nations. But it is essentially personal enfranchisement for where liberty dwells, said Franklin, the sage of the revolution, there is my country. Equality of rights is the sinusure of our union of states, the grand exemplar of the correlative equality of individuals, and while truth sheds its effulgence, we cannot retrograde without dissolving the one and subverting the other. We must onward to the fulfillment of our mission, to the entire development of the principle of our organization, freedom of conscience, freedom of person, freedom of trade and business pursuits, universality of freedom and equality, this is our high destiny, and in nature's eternal, inevitable decree of cause and effect, we must accomplish it. All this will be our future history, to establish on earth the moral dignity and salvation of man, the immutable truth and beneficence of God. For this blessed mission to the nations of the world, which are shut out from the life-giving light of truth, 
has America been chosen, and her high example shall smite unto death the tyranny of kings, hierarchs, and oligarchs, and carry the glad tidings of peace and goodwill where myriads now endure an existence scarcely more enviable than that of beasts of the field. Who then can doubt that our country is destined to be the great nation of futurity? That was The Great Nation of Futurity by John L. O'Sullivan. Find more classics of liberty at libertarianism.org.